Bruce Willis has starred in a lot of movies over the course of his career, and I admit I haven't seen every single one, but this movie has to be up there with the most bizarre and terrible. And not just with all of his filmography, I would say with all of the movies that came out that year, right beside North. He was in that too. Hey guys, welcome back to the show, and on this episode, I'm going to be talking about Color of Night. It's a movie from 1994 that goes all over the place. It's a murder, mystery, sex-filled romp through the adventures of group therapy. And if that doesn't get your attention, I don't know what will. Yes, for two hours and 19 minutes, I experienced it all. At times I was scared, other times I was aroused, but most of the time I was laughing, even though the movie's not supposed to be a comedy. The movie starts with this lady trying to put on lipstick, and you're probably thinking, what the hell is she doing? This isn't right at all. Well, you have to remember, this was in 1994. And before YouTube makeup tutorials, nobody really knew what they were doing. Everybody just guessed and hoped they were doing it right. So she goes to see her psychologist, Bill, and I have to say, I don't think he's very good. One minute you have friends, the next moment they've slipped away. You leave here and I wonder, who is, who is Michelle hating this week? I try to remember and I can't. Anyways, Bill's patient decides this isn't really working for her, so she jumps out the window. <laughs> also, I just want to point out, I hate these types of shots. You know, where they make it seem like you can see through the ground. I just... It always takes me out of the illusion. I don't know, maybe that's just me. So he looks out the window and sees all the blood and he's just like, ugh. And his brain basically says, well, you're not seeing that anymore. And now we have our protagonist's fatal flaw. He can't see the color red. That's obviously the real tragedy from this whole thing. He's the real victim here. Well, think about it. How is he ever going to be able to tell the difference between an apple and a tomato? How will he be able to drive anymore? I mean, we all know what a red light means, but gray? That's not covered in driving school. Same with stop signs. I mean, sure, it says stop, but if it's not red, should I really take it seriously? What if it's fake? Well, on the bright side, maybe he can learn from this whole experience. Maybe he can take this as an opportunity to grow as a professional and start renting an office on the first floor. So Bill decides, I'm going to fly out to Los Angeles and see my psychiatrist friend, Bob. Which I can only imagine, if he could, Scott Bakula would time travel back to before he agreed to be in this movie. I guess Bill thinks that hanging out with his old friend and sitting in on his group therapy sessions will be good for him in terms of dealing with his patient's suicide. And that's when we're introduced to the group. A collection of uninteresting characters with a variety of different issues. But I bet if I told you that one of these people was wearing a disguise to hide their true identity, you could probably figure that out, right? No. It seems like the movie likes to draw our attention to one of these people for some reason. I wonder what that could be. So anyways, it doesn't take long for the anger to boil over and the action to start. The thing I really want to know is how do they decide who gets to sit in the baseball glove chair every session? I mean, there's got to be a system in place, right? You can't just leave it up to them. This does not seem like a rational group. So they arrive at Bob's house, which is in a very smoky neighborhood, and Bill is like, damn, Bob, didn't know you were so rich, even though we're supposed to be friends. Bob mentions his young girlfriend. I'm sure that won't come back later in the movie. So then Bill gets emotional and says, he might be going crazy. And Bob says, yeah, maybe, but let's go on a bike ride. And that right there, ladies and gentlemen, is the sign of a true master at work. This is probably how he got so rich in the first place. I mean, why take the time addressing and solving people's problems when you can just distract them with something else? Oh, you're starting to feel like a failure of a psychologist because your patient committed suicide right in front of you and you're starting to feel like you're losing your mind? Bike ride. So during the bike ride, Bill asks, Hey, what's with all the home security? Well, it turns out someone is trying to kill Bob, and he suspects it's someone from the therapy group. And I bet you can guess what happens next. They race all the way home. Oh yeah, and then later that night, Bob gets murdered. This is actually kind of a weird sequence, because Bob is in his office and gets scared, so he takes a gun out of his desk 
then realizes he's just being paranoid, so he puts it back, but then when he actually sees something, he doesn't go back to get the gun. And then this whole thing turns into Assassin's Creed and he's dead. Anyways, this is where we're introduced to Lieutenant Martinez, who is basically the combination of every hard-nosed cop in every movie that you've ever seen. If I didn't know any better, I'd swear this was a parody, but it's not. And I know you've heard me say that on this show before, but I'm serious. There's one part in the movie where as they're leaving a bar, he bumps into a guy and just does a quick stop and frisk mid-conversation. Yeah, you see this? I can just feel people up whenever I want because I'm a cop and it's not groping because I have probable cause. He bumped into me, which means he could have drugs. So Bill goes back and just starts living in his dead friend's house. I guess Bob didn't have any other family members at all. So Martinez comes to the house the next day and says, hey Bill, I wanna search the house for clues. And Bill asks if he has a warrant. And Martinez says, no dude, I don't have a warrant. I'm trying to figure out who killed your friend. And Bill is like, oh yeah, I guess that makes sense. What, you think you can just waltz in here and start looking for clues just because my friend was murdered? Well, you gotta, you know, have a warrant or something. Because you gotta, you gotta respect my rights, detective, as a squatter. I'm trying to take over my friend's life here. So anyways, as Bill is out driving Bob's car and talking on Bob's phone, he gets rear-ended by a beautiful young lady named Rose. I'm Rose. Hi, Rose. I see you to run into me like this. <laughs> I know it's against the law and everything. Don't buzz my chops. By the way, the broken tail light is like the economy car accident for film and television. If you're producing something and you're on a tight budget and you want to show, you know, some kind of a car accident or something, even just a small one, broken tail light. Because it's relatively easy and inexpensive to fix and you don't have to get any body work done on the car. So now Bill has to tell the group that Bob's dead, which of course leads to everyone yelling and the guy who's obsessed with counting asking how many times Bob was stabbed. Many times, Clark. More than 30. That's all I can tell you. Now you're probably sitting there thinking, wait a second, that doesn't make any sense. Mark, we didn't see him get stabbed that many times in the actual scene. Well, yes, but there's many explanations for that. I mean, we saw the killer leave. Maybe he just left to take a break and then came back later and just stabbed him a bunch more times. Or maybe the autopsy uh, counted all the times he was cut by glass as stab wounds. That could happen. The point is, the numbers aren't really important. What's important is how long Bill intends on squatting in Bob's house and living his best life while his friend rots in the ground. So Bill goes home, and I guess he not only lost his ability to see red, but he lost the ability to see liquid as well because he doesn't notice that the floor is completely covered in running water. Of course, it might be the killer. Maybe they're in the house right now. Oh, no, it's just a hose, which was turned on and pointed towards the door for some reason that we'll never find out. But that's okay, because as Bill is hanging up a bunch of wet clothes, I guess Bob wasn't rich enough to afford a dryer, Rose suddenly shows up and Bill starts narrating as if he's writing his own novel in his mind. Here she is, little angel, dancing on the head of a pin. And this is actually really weird. He does this throughout the movie. It's as if he's trying to do uh, like a film noir voiceover, except that he's saying it out loud to himself in the scene. So. Are we eating in or are you taking me out? <laughs> Man, isn't this just the epitome of movie fantasy? You get rear-ended, but there's no real damage. And the person driving the car is this beautiful young woman who just randomly shows up at your house asking for a date right then and there. See, I'm just too skeptical of a person. If this happened to me in real life, I'd be looking over my shoulder every step of the way. I'm too cynical, there's no way, this has gotta be a setup. That or I'm gonna go to dinner with this chick and find out something horrible about her. 
You know, like maybe she's one of these people who doesn't eat her pizza crusts. Yeah, I said it. I know you're out there. I bet there's some people watching this video right now who are crust abandoners. Now, I'm not gonna go off on a huge tangent here, but I'm just gonna say this. The crust is a wonderful part of the pizza. It's like a built-in breadstick at the end of the slice. And who doesn't love breadsticks? I would be willing to bet that there are some real psychos out there who not only don't eat their crusts, but actually order breadsticks with the pizza. You know, or crazy bread or whatever. So let's just draw a line in the sand right now, okay? I need to know where my audience stands on this. So this is the question for the comments. After the video, check the comment section. I'm gonna have uh, two comments and you like the one for which team you're on, all right? I'm gonna make one comment for team eat crusts and one for team quitter because that's really what you are. But what if I'm ashamed of what I do? Why? Why would you be ashamed of being a shrink? I told you I was a shrink. Okay, so she tries to pass it off as if she knows his profession based on the way he looks at her. Wow, the evidence is really piling up that she clearly knows more than she's letting on. She's most likely the young woman who Bob was involved with. But who cares? Bill has already taken over Bob's life anyways. It's time to make out quickly before the valet guy sees us. Everyone knows how judgmental he is. So Dale, the brother of Richie from the therapy group, you know, the character that the movie keeps drawing your attention to, goes to Bob's office, which again, I guess is Bill's office now, to ask him to take Richie out of therapy, which was court ordered. And Bill says he'll talk to probation about it. Bill goes home to check the mail that isn't his, and boom, it's the old snake in the mailbox trick. I'm gonna be honest, I have a hard time sympathizing with Bill here. Now you're probably thinking, Mark, what's the problem? He's just taking the mail out of the mailbox. What's wrong with that? Well, because that's how it all starts. And then it leads to him opening the mail. And that, my friends, is a federal crime. Next thing you know, he's responding to the letters. And where does it all lead to? Identity theft. He's already pretty much stolen his house, his cars, and his profession. He's more than halfway there already. So yeah, snake in the mailbox. Maybe see this as a lesson, Bill. Something you can learn from. Grow as a person. Be better. I also love how there's a car coming down the road and instead of just slowing down, the guy screams at him like, Hey, get off the road! Then he calls to some guy for help, but he can't hear him because he's using a leaf blower. By the way, I've always loved the concept of a leaf blower. It's like a mechanical version of sweeping something under the rug. It's like, oh look, some leaves. Well, I could pick them up myself, or I can just strap on this machine that will just blow the problem somewhere else. See, now, instead of one problem for me, I've just turned it into many, many problems for somebody else. I'm just kidding. I know they have a practical purpose. So then Bill takes a shovel and gets rid of the snake, which apparently hates people from the East Coast. <laughs> I'm not going back to New York, you hear me? You're stuck with me. Okay, so then Rose comes over and he starts narrating again. Here she comes. Weightless. Hanging from the sky. Wearing a short dress of indeterminate color. You know, on your first date, you said you were gonna give up lipstick out of respect for his color blindness. And now you come over here dressed in red? What's the deal here, Rose? But it doesn't matter anyways, because it's pool sex time. Yeah, so pretty much all of this I can't show you because YouTube would just demonetize me to death. So instead, I'm going to show you a reenactment. Not with me, weirdos. I'm gonna use toys. And then suddenly Rose says that she wants them to get dressed up and serves him dinner wearing absolutely nothing. And then we're right back to sex, this time in the shower. And you know what? I don't see any soap. I don't see any shampoo. There's no conditioner. This is just sex. It's a complete waste of water. And I, for one, am appalled. Now, I'm not like a hippie or anything like that, but I try and do my part for the environment. I recycle. I reuse. 
as you've probably noticed. I mean, a lot of these shirts I've been wearing for 10 years now. And when it comes to water usage, I try to be very efficient. I have a very simple shower routine. I get in, I soap, I rinse, and then I stand there for about five minutes under the hot water as I psych myself up mentally to start another day in this cruel world. Yeah, sometimes on this show I tell jokes, sometimes I get real. So Sandra from the therapy group is taking part in a romantic relationship with Bonnie, who is actually Rose in disguise, putting on a British accent. I could tell right away it was her based on her teeth. Not saying that her teeth are ugly or anything, I just found them to be recognizable. Bill is inquiring about Richie's history and finds out that Richie was molested as a child. And if it hasn't clicked for you by now, I'm actually envious because it was around this point that I realized that Rose, again, the mysterious woman who's clearly disguising herself as Bonnie, is also Richie as well. So Bill tries to visit the Wizard of Oz, but he can't get past the biggest front door in all of America. Then, while Bill is driving, the killer calls him from a car phone and starts taunting him, saying that they're in the red car. But Bill can't see red! Oh no! I knew it was gonna come into play at some point. It could be anyone! What's he gonna do? So he looks around trying to see who has a car phone antenna, and it could be anyone. I mean, come on, Bill, it's LA. Then the killer starts ramming Bill's car, and this is just heartbreaking. I mean, what kind of a world do we live in? When a man can't drive around in his dead friend's car without constantly being rear-ended. See, now this is the type of stuff that I love. It just adds that little bit of destruction to the chase scene. You know, it could be a hot dog vendor or a fruit stand, two people carrying a giant pane of glass across the road. But if you're on a budget, you know, a shopping cart full of food works just as well. Now, this is weird. Bill and the killer kind of have this reverse tug of war on the train tracks, where Bill puts his car into reverse, backing into the killer, keeping their car on the tracks, while the killer is trying to push Bill's car forward. So why doesn't the killer just reverse? Especially at the last second, that way, Bill will reverse right into the path of the train. Anyways, Bill comes home and oh my god, the gate is open. Well, it turns out it's only Rose in the kitchen, wearing nothing but an apron. How did you get in here? <sighs> Last time I was here, I stole the key. It was by the door. What about the alarm? Oh. People are getting killed around here. You're walking around like it's goddamn Disneyland. What if something were to happen to you? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Baby, I'm sorry. This is a very nice surprise. <laughs> really? Bill. Man, okay, I get it, all right? She's hot, the sex is great, but dude, there are crazy flags popping up all over the place. You've seen this woman, what, maybe three times now? And she steals the key to the house? How much do you know about this person? You don't even have her number. And every time you ask for it... <laughs> Christ, Kappa. I can't have people tying up the phone lines. I'm trying to run a business here. Yeah, Bill, she's trying to run a business here. She can't tie up the phone lines, you know? She's gotta keep it open for her business. Doing, I don't know, something. She'll just come over randomly, and if you're not there, she'll steal a key so she can get into the house. I mean, come on, be reasonable here. That's normal. So then Bill finds a photo of Rose in Bob's diary, and it turns out she's been dating everyone in the therapy group and using the name Bonnie, but none of them knew it. And now it's the return of the red car, and this sequence makes absolutely no sense. The car follows him, Bill parks his car inside of a parkade, and somehow the red car knows where he is and what direction he's walking, even though the red car is on the top floor. Look at this angle. There is absolutely no way in hell the person driving this car would be able to see him. And not only that, it's somehow able to predict when he's going to walk in a different direction and tries to push a car on top of him. So then we have the big reveal. Oh, you just help me. Richie Dexter is dead. He killed himself four years ago. Oh my God, I am so shocked. You mean to tell me that this person is not who they say they are? I am in total disbelief. I can't believe it. Won't believe it. Turns out that Richie killed himself four years ago, and Dale and Rose are his siblings. 
And it turns out that Rose has a multiple personality disorder and Dale is the killer who forced Rose to become Richie. And not only that, he's very proficient with a nail gun, so much so that he's able to nail Martinez's hands to the wall. And now after Rose kills Dale, we have one final attempt to make a Hitchcock film with this final vertigo-like scene where they climb to the top of this, I don't know, tower, and Bill has his chance to redeem himself, to save his patient from jumping to her death. And you know he succeeded because look, he can see red again. And then during these last few emotional seconds, we hear Martinez yelling at Bill to help him. Get me out of here! I'm not sure if this was supposed to be funny. You know, one of those moments where the audience is like, oh, <laughs> that's right, that other character is still trapped down there. Oh, well, since everything's resolved, we can laugh out of relief now. But it's not like this guy is, you know, just locked in a room or something goofy like that. He was shot multiple times with a nail gun and has his arms and hands stuck to the wall. That would be really painful. Not exactly a source of comic relief. And that's the end of the movie. I know some of you are probably saying, but Mark, what will Bill do now? I mean, will he go back to New York where he actually lives? Or will he continue living his dead friend's life? What about the patients in the therapy group? Will he be actually able to help them? Well, I really don't know. Weren't you paying attention? Bill can see red again. Who cares about all the other stuff? This is, remember what I said at the beginning of the video? This is the real tragedy here. Solved. Now this movie won the Razzie for worst film of 1994, but it also won the award for best sex scene of all time in Maxim Magazine. An award that I completely disagree with because as we all know, the greatest sex scene of all time is the popcorn scene in Troll 2 with showgirls coming in at a close second. And as usual, I hope you guys had more fun watching this video than I did watching this video. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you all next time.